Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Parmenides, as you can see, argued that nothing ever changes. Now, you can look at this either as an empirical proposition or as a logical proposition. Empirically, from the world of senses, from the world of experience, it is not possible to say that nothing ever changes, because empirically, what Heraclitus said seems to be closer to truth from the world of experience, because experience keeps changing all the time. So, what does Parmenides mean when he says nothing ever changes? The proof or the argument is not empirical, but logical. It goes something like this. Suppose we are talking about somebody, Mahatma Gandhi, right? Just say somebody, Mahatma Gandhi. Is Mahatma Gandhi a part of the present? People will say no, he is only part of the past. He died. Okay. Can we talk of somebody? Who will be Mahatma Gandhi's, Gandhi's great, 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 great grandchild? That is a matter of future. Can we talk about the future when we are in the present? Again, pretty much not possible. So, we have the distinction of time and space, which seems to interfere with our perception of things and alter the perception of things. If I were to say Mahatma Gandhi, Im immediately there is evoked in you a feeling that something has happened and gone, which is why we are talking of Mahatma Gandhi. If I am talking to you, going to talk to you about a name which you have not heard of at all, then you will say, oh, it does not belong to now, it is not part of what we have here. So, whether something is here or there or ever seems to be from the world of senses constrained and bound by the idea of time. Is it present? Is it past? Is it future? This seems to be the question which seems to formulate to us the idea of what is. Am I saying it right? Do you want me to say it again? Yes? Can I go on? So, Parmenides found that our perception, our understanding of things is incomplete as long as such a perception and understanding is conveyed to us by the limitation of time the awareness of the present versus past versus future. So, he looks at something further, deeper and says, okay, when I say something, when I say Mahatma Gandhi, am I talking of something which is gone, dead and gone? No, because people are still talking of Mahatma Gandhi. So, Mahatma Gandhi is dead and gone. But people are still talking of Mahatma Gandhi. There is a meaning which he makes to them today, right? And there is a meaning which he will make to people two years from now. In other words, when people talked of Mahatma Gandhi, just because Mahatma Gandhi passed away 50 years ago, it does not mean that Mahatma Gandhi is a void, it does not mean he is nothing. No? Mahatma Gandhi makes the meanings today, 
he makes one meaning to people today, he made one meaning to people 50 years ago, he made one, he will make one meaning to people in the future. So, he goes on to say, therefore, Mahatma Gandhi is changeless, he is there in the past, he is there today, he will be there in the future. As long as there is somebody who remembers to refer to Mahatma Gandhi, it means Mahatma Gandhi has a meaning. There might be a time and a place where nobody might have a reference to Mahatma Gandhi at all. They might not have heard of that word at all. In that place, he has no meaning. So, what is important then is to understand that whether we understand, whether we perceive the meaning in Mahatma Gandhi or not is only a matter of how time influences us, but the meaning itself does not change. If I am talking about Mahatma Gandhi here, I understand him one way. If I am talking about Mahatma Gandhi in Gujarat, I am understanding him in another way. In other words, what he is saying is meanings do not change, but the way you perceive meanings is subject to the influence of time and space. Make sense? So, Parmenides says nothing ever changes, change is only superficial. Want to write this down? So, Parmenides had a strong case to make against the idea of the void. So, he says, you say that void is a thing, but nothing that is, nothing that is not can exist and therefore, there is no such thing as void. Look at the fine play of logic here. He says, you say that void is a thing, but nothing that is not can exist. Therefore, there is no void. He's playing with words, you know, but the point is very clearly made. He is opposed to the idea of void. And along with Parmenides begins this big debate in Greece. Should I accept the theory of the void? Should I accept the theory of the plenum, P L E N U M, which is, which means the world is full of, there is no empty space, the world is full, P L E N U M plenum. So, the debate was was it a plenum, was it a void? If it is a plenum, the world is full of this one thing. If it is void, there is really no thing. This argument which Parmenides made against the void as an aside, we can look at the way a Zen Buddhist might have answered that. If you remember in the last class, we saw that the Buddhists were talking of Sunyavada they were talking of void too and the Zen Buddhists of Japan are direct descendants of the school of Buddhism, Madhyamika and the Zen Buddhists are looking at this void as a no thing, it is not nothing because you do not know anything about it, it is a no thing. You cannot say it is 0, you cannot say it is void, you cannot say anything. So, the Zen Buddhists found a nice explanation for the void, which answers what Parmenides said. Parmenides made a play with the word, no? Void means nothing. So, he says, you say void is a thing, 
and then you say then he says nothing which is not can exist and therefore, why it does not exist. So, this will say we escape from this whole play of words by simply saying there is no nothing, there is no thing, there is only there is no thing right. That no thing is again what Buddha was talking about when he used a similar term. He never used any description for any permanent eternal principle, he never talked about it. So, by that token everybody thought Buddha was an atheist, true he did not accept any form of organized religion and worship, but does it, does it mean that Buddha denied that the world was a plenum, nobody knows because Buddha never said sunya, Buddha never said sunyata which his disciple said. Buddha used the word tathatha, have you heard of that expression tathatha, tatha in Hindi and Sanskrit means what? That, tatha is that, tathatha is thatness. Buddha would only say thatness, he says I cannot say anything more, I cannot even say it is it, I cannot even say there is something, but he says if you go through the process of contemplation and removing conditioning from your mind one after another after another, then you get to a point when you are simply that, so he says tathatha. So, Buddha went one step further than all this, he did not say there was void, there was plenum, no. He accepted neither, he says there is tatha. So, which is why the Buddhas were referred to in Buddhist terminology as tathagata. Tatha, gatha, that means people who are in that state of thatness. So anyway this is a little aside we went into Buddhism because it triggers a nice little thought on a parallel line. Take another step beyond this you find on the story of Buddhism, centuries after Buddha there was a man called Gaudapada. Gaudapada decided that he would write a summary of the different darshanas, the different experiences of people. So, he started looking for it, he finds that at his time there were 28 types of darshanas, Sankhya, Mimamsa and so on and so forth in which Buddhism was one of the darshanas. He ends up writing so much on the darshanas that later day philosophers who are trying to find out what Gaudapada really was, large number of them, large number of them said Gaudapada is actually a fine Buddhist who does not acknowledge that he is a Buddhist because his arguments are so pro Nagarjuna. There were a whole lot of others who were upset by this because Gaudapada was referred to as Paramacharya by none other than Adi Shankara. Adi Shankara's guru was Gaudapada's student. So, eventually Adi Shankara went on to formulate a system which included you know Bhajagovindam, it included Saundarya Lahiri, Shivananda Lahiri, all on gods. The point I am making is this issue of plenum versus void has such ramifications, such implications. If you just take it across the planet earth from Greece on to the Indian subcontinent, you really find 
that there is no resolution to this problem of whether something is a plenum, something is void. But at this point in time, Parmenides clearly argued by simply playing with words that void does not exist. That means this world is not a void. Now, Parmenides, Parmenides is followed in our list by Empedocles. who was not a mystic, on whom the Orphic cults made no impact, on whom, on whom theories of reincarnation had no meaning. In fact, he was an empiricist. He said, if you took a vessel, empty vessel, inverted it and put it into water, water does not get into it even if it is empty. He says it contains something inside which is preventing the water from going in. So, for the first time, for the first time in the history of science, somebody proved that there is an independent substance called air. He proved it. Not only did he prove that there was an independent substance called air, he also proved by that token water is an independent substance too, because air and water keep its, each other away from that vessel which is inverted. No, when the vessel inverted vessel is turned a little bit, then air water enters it evicts air. So, which means in their natural state, air and water must be independent substances. So, he goes on to say not only air, air, water, fire, earth they are all independent substances for the first time. And for the first time, he is talking about air, water, fire and earth in scientific terms, not like Thales and Anaximander and others, we are talking about more philosophical speculation. This whole world is water. Why? Because we are surrounded by water. Whereas, Empedocles could say, no, no, this vessel contains air because it is not letting water into it. So, the perception was different. The perception was more scientific in the modern sense of the word. And Empedocles clearly argued against the theory of void. He says, when you have all these substances independent, if you have air, you have water, you, how can you talk of void? How can there be nothing? So, he simply dismissed the Heraclitian idea of a void, totally dismissed it. And then he also discovered the idea of a centrifugal force. He says, if you take water in a vessel, in a cup, tie a string to the cup and spin it around you. The water in the cup will never spill. Why? Because it is at the edge of the cup, on the side of the cup, pressing against the side of the cup and it is being prevented from getting thrown out. So, for the first time somebody discovers what today is called the centrifugal force. The, the, the Empedocles was the person who discovered it. And more important, Empedocles discovered that plants have sex. There are male plants, there are female plants for the first time. So, you can see how profound this man's mind was. Long before scientists were talking about the process of pollination among plants, this man understood that plants have sexes. There are male plants, there are female plants, which result in the propagation of plant life. And the earliest known theory of evolution is also propounded by Empedocles. He is not like Darwin, but he says that in the past, the world was full of all kinds of myriads of creatures. 
he talks of creatures with 10 heads and 15 arms and so on and so forth. And not all of them, they were competing on this planet for survival and he found not all of them were fit for survival. So, one by one, the ones unfit for survival, those species died out and the others came and he says human beings have survived because they are more fit than other older species. So, here is a first known articulation of the theory of evolution. Once again, Empedocles is talking about it. Do you want to write some of these down? And then Empedocles also, also knew that the moon was not self-luminescent. He knew that the moon was only reflecting sun's light the first time. And he also thought the sun itself was reflecting some other light, where of course he was not right, correct. But the idea that what you see in the sky as light coming from bodies of planets in the sky, that that light could be reflected light and not light of their own, luminescence of their own was the first time. That he spotted it in the moon and thought it should be the case with the sun also can be quite simply forgiven by the fact of the profundity of this re realization. He also understood the cause of efflux, not the cause of eclipses that the moon intercedes between the sun and the earth and casts a shadow on the sun and thereby there is a solar eclipse. Perhaps he learnt it from a contemporary Anaxagoras who talked a lot more on astronomy than he did, but whatever he was able to articulate it and most important and finally, he was an excellent physician, he had excellent knowledge of human anatomy. So, he founded the Italian school of medicine, which became so popular and lasted such a long while that all three Socrates, Plato and Aristotle were all influenced strongly by the knowledge which they picked up from the Italian school of medicine. But most important, Empedocles did not believe in any kind of monism. He did not believe either in the theory of void or in the theory of monism. For the first time, he articulated a point of view which is purely modern in its quality. He said life was governed by chance and necessity. It was not governed by any teleology, it was not governed by any cosmic force, it was not governed by any factor which was not explainable. He says no, life was governed by chance and necessity. What happened could be explained in terms of necessities in the lives of people, necessities in nature and more importantly happenings which were due to chance. To accept the random as a random and not throw it into the explanation of monistic causes was the first and foremost attempt here. There was no teleology in his writing, there was no original purpose or original cause, there was only chance and necessity which governed life and therefore, there was no void either. Perhaps the Greek scientific mind 
really excelled itself when it found itself in people, people like an Empedocles. Let us now look at Anaxagoras. Anaxagoras also is opposed to the theory of void. Anaxagoras was also scientific in the sense that he was trying to talk about cosmos, he was trying to cosmos, he was trying to talk about life from the point of view of what he thought was his awareness, his understanding of life around him. So, he could not accept the theory of void for the simple reason that he saw no void when life was full of all kinds of forces, all kinds of things. He did not, he did not really go into the debate of monism versus void. He was, he didn't become a monist either. It was all the time empirical. For instance, he saw, he taught that sun is a red hot stone. It's a huge, massive stone which is red hot, which is why he says during dusk and dawn you can see it in its original color which is red. And moon itself was nothing other than a planet like earth. So, his view of the planetary system irritated the religious fanatics of his time so much that he had to flee, he had to leave. But he was such a dedicated teacher that he went back to Ionia from where he came, set up a school there and he was so dedicated that he wrote a will in which only one thing figured. He said after I am dead, each of the days when you are celebrating my anniversary, it should be a holiday for children because the children must play. So, that was how Anaxagoras's life ended. What is important in his findings is, his, he revives the idea of balance which the Milesians had. He accepts what Heraclitus says that things contain opposites within themselves, but he talks of the opposites as being in a constant state of balance. And for the first time in Greek philosophy, we find somebody talking about the mind, the mind as being all important, nuva, nous. Now, nous enters subsequently into large number of debates in Greece, whether there is such a thing, whether there is not such a thing, but he is the first one who brings into western philosophy the idea of an independent mind. In later times there is a lot of debate about whether mind and matter are independent from each other, but this is the first articulation by anybody in the west that the mind is independent, not only independent, it permeates everything. It controls and reigns over everything. And two, the mind is responsible for all motion. And he also says that the mind causes rotations in the planet, which tend to move like waves in a pond. When you drop a stone in them, the rings of waves move in the same way the mind can be in one place and cause rotations in the planet. So, what he means by rotations in the planet, we do not know, but certainly he is talking of some kind of field of energy which the mind can control that much can be understood.
in Anaxagoras you find great pragmatism. He rejects the theory of void. At the same time, he does not talk of any kind of monistic principle. He does not think in terms of anything which is an original cause. He does not think of anything which is the end purpose of all existence. In other words, he is not a theist in that sense. He is pragmatic. According to literary thinkers, particularly Plato and Aristotle, they thought Anaxagoras was an incomplete thinker because they both thought if he had gone to the point of specifying the existence of news, the mind, then he makes no use of this discovery and to show how this dominates everything, how it controls, it permeates, he does not say anything. So, they say he is an incomplete thinker. So, Anaxagoras was not as profound as a celebrity thinker as others were, but you can say very clearly that he represents the spirit of scientific inquiry in the sense that he will not commit himself to either void or monism for the simple reason that he does not have enough basis to argue either. So, this method of reasoning is what qualifies him as very powerful, very significant. Let us just go on, go on to the last of the list which I was thinking of for you which are the atomists, Lucifer's and Democritus. They are both attributed the status of having founded the school of atomists. In a sense, it is true, but they spoke differently in different places, they lived separately in different places, they did not constitute a single school of thought as it were. The atomists were called atomists because they believed that everything was composed of atoms, and they believed that they were physically indivisible units of this universe which were impenetrable and imperishable and varied in shape and weight, which basically means that they were thinking of atoms as the basic, basic building block of the universe precisely as modern nuclear physicists are talking about. It also means that they were thinking in terms of a via media between the monists and those who are talking of the void. In fact, Bertrand Russell argues that the atomists were saying what they did, basically they wanted because they wanted to find the middle ground between people like Heraclitus on the one hand and people like Parmenides on the other. They could not accept the fact is, they could not accept the world as a void. They could not again accept the determinism of a single original cause and a single purpose for all life. So, in this quest of trying to find a middle ground, according to Burton Russell, the atomists went about finding whatever they did, which was so astonishing. According to them, not only are that there are atoms which are indivisible physically and which are many shaped, many sized, but these atoms are always in motion and in that process they, they clash with each other, they combine, they change morphology, they change the shapes of each other and what is most important, atoms are impenetrable. And finally, atoms could do all this moving around because there is space between the atoms, otherwise how could they move? 
in a plenum, nothing can move because it is packed. No, plenum is full, it is packed. If all the seats in this room are full, who could move around from one seat to another? So, atoms could move because there is space between them and motion became possible, but atoms themselves were impenetrable, they cannot be cut open to see and divided to see what they were inside. See, a lovely via media was provided here between the widests and the monists. The widest could see in the system that there is space between the atoms, so there is void. But at the same time, the atoms themselves were ultimate particles, which could not be further reduced or penetrated or cut. So, the monists were satisfied that these were the single determinant. At the same time, they ended up constituting an entirely different way of looking at this universe. So, perhaps not just philosophically, but scientifically, the atomists took the biggest leap forward among the Greeks. Not only this, but in terms of thought, you remember Anaxagoras was talking about mind, news. The atomists did not accept anything like news, but they accepted thought. They accepted that thought is very physical, it is not a product of some invisible thing called news. They said it is a physical process. Thought happens because there are atomic movements and two types of perceptions they distinguished very nicely. They said one perception which is through the senses and another perception which you can deduce reason out which is an understanding. You can perceive two chalk pieces and say here are two chalk pieces that is from the senses. But you understand that there are two chalk pieces because you see one and then you see another and you reason out that one plus one must make two. So, the two types of perception are significant. In the understanding type of perception, it depends on sense because you have to perceive the two chalk pieces. So, all understanding depends upon sense perception, but sense perception is dependent on external factors whether there is enough light in this room, can I see the chalk pieces or whether there is something blurred in my vision. Or At the same time, they mistrusted the senses because the senses could mislead. The atomists also believed that there is not really this world in which we live, but this reflects the existence of many, many other worlds and that it was possible to find life on some of these other worlds. Most important, the atomists believed neither in the news nor in any monistic principle nor in the theory of void, and they were the first ones to articulate the idea of natural laws. Everything that happens on the planet happens only according to natural laws, nothing else. So, with the atomists, we find the whole development of scientific and speculative thinking of the Greeks taking a very definitive form. It is reached a state where it could start leading to growth and thinking in the times to come. Having said this, it is also a fact that 
as Burton Russell says, beyond the atomist, you find that the Greek thought is dominated by Socrates, by Plato and Aristotle, all of whom were con confounding themselves with some kind of mystical beliefs. They all found the carryover in themselves of the original mythological beliefs in different forms. The Orphic beliefs carried themselves into the Pythagorean system. So, despite all the geometry and mathematics and deductive thinking in the Pythagorean system at the heart of it all were the Orphic belief in the existence of a transmigrating soul. This influence lasted deep into the thinking of both, not only both, all of Socrates, Plato and Aristotle. And in this sense, once again Greek philosophy became subject to faith rather than reasoning. In Plato, you find a strange mixture. In fact, in all three you find a strange mixture of reasoning constantly trying to bolster up something which is an article of faith. We will talk about Plato, Socrates and Aristotle in the next class, but this is an important thing. At the bottom in all three minds there is faith, there is a monistic faith and all the reason and all the reasoning is used by these people to support and strengthen and bolster this faith. In a sense, Burton Russell seems to hit the nail on the head when he says, Plato was not a genuine thinker. He compares them to people like Empedocles, people like the atomists who stake their faith in reason, stake their faith in what Pythagoras called the geometric method and went only by it and stopped where it stopped, did not go beyond and to speculate into faith. So, Russell feels that the great growth of scientific thinking ended with the atomists and then came the classical period when all the great Socrates and Plato's and Aristotle's came. He said by and large this was a false period where faith dominated reasoning. Having said that, let me also go one step further to say, this is a very important feature of western thinking. Articulating something which is first and foremost a profound article of faith and then using reason as a very powerful tool all the time to prove what is a matter of faith. The whole of the history of Christianity from a couple of centuries after Christ onwards right up to the time of 16th century when Descartes was writing developed this trait that you must you can sign you can reasonably or rationally establish something which the Christian faith is talking about. So, a whole lot of theological debates occur in this period where reason is used continuously to debate something which only faith can show. So, you have among the scholastics whom we will talk about this continuous attempt to use reason as a hand tool of faith. This is what Russell meant when he said that the great eclipse happened after the atomists in Greece. Even Descartes you find 
is overawed. I would not say Descartes is full of fear, we will talk about Descartes later, but Descartes is riven in two by the Christian in himself, the believing Christian and the incredible mathematical philosopher in himself. So that he is using proofs, he is trying to establish the proofs of God using methods which were as old as scholastics centuries before him. So this is an old thing in the West, trying to start with a faith and using reason to support what is the matter of faith. It goes right through the history of Christianity. It comes right through up to the time of Descartes. Why Galileo? Galilei made such incredible astronomical statements, but he had to recant. Otherwise, he would have been persecuted and killed. He recanted and said, no, 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 I did not mean what I said. So this was the power of faith which ruled the West. Eventually you would find that the whole thing ends first in the reformation of the church itself. Reason creates different churches and then finally you find that religion itself slowly lapses and gives way to the age of enlightenment in the 17th and 18th centuries when this old habit of first believing and then using reason to support your belief slowly dies down. But that is the story which we are going to study in the times to come. At this point in time, I shall say that we are done with the Greeks. The purpose of looking at the Greeks was to understand the reasons why people were looking for universals. We found that it could be faith, it could be reason and we found that all the processes of reason which looked for universal led to modern science and economics is a science. And we found that in the way there were processes which led to looking for universals on faith. And therefore, what universals people actually articulated, this we can say clearly, depended upon the conditions and context in which they lived. Copernicus was not persecuted, but Galileo was afraid of being persecuted. Giordano Bruno was persecuted. So, the conditions under which people could speak a proposition of reason fearlessly or whether they were hesitant, whether they were curbed, nobody could say. But this is for us to see in the classes to come. Have a good evening.